There are 241 town meeting members. 121 constitutes a quorum. The constable informs me that a quorum is present. The first session of the 257th annual town meeting will now come to order. The clerk will read the call and return of the meeting. Hampshire SS, to one of the constables of the town of Amherst in said county, greetings. In the name of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, you are hereby directed to notify the registered voters of the town of Amherst of the annual town meeting to be held in the auditorium of the Amherst Pelham Regional Middle School in said Amherst at 7 o'clock on Monday, the 27th day of April, 2015, when the following articles will be acted upon by town meeting members. You are hereby directed to serve this call by posting attested copies thereof at the usual places. Hereof feel not and make return of this warrant with your doings thereon at the time and place of said meeting. Given under our hands this 23rd day of March 2015, Aaron A. Hayden, Constance C. Kruger, Elisa V. Brewer, James J. Wald, Andrew J. Steinberg. March 24, 2015, Hampshire SS, in obedience to the within warrant, I have this day, as directed, posted true and attested copies thereof at the designated places. Thomas J. Sarna, Constable, Town of Amherst. Do you want this sworn in also? Thank you. Nope. I have already been sworn in as moderator by the town clerk. At this point, I would like to ask all newly elected town meeting members to rise or raise your hand if you can't rise to be sworn in. All raise your right hand, please. Do you swear that you will faithfully and impartially perform the duties of town meeting member? Please answer, I do. I do. Thank you, and congratulations. That was very sweet, but that's the only time I will allow applause. So I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I'd also like to congratulate those elected to town-wide offices. I will say their names, but there will not be applause. School Committee, Vera Duangmani Cage and Phoebe Hazard. Select Board, Douglas Slaughter. Housing Authority, Tracy Lee Boutelier. Thank you in advance for your service. Doug Slaughter has resigned his position on the Finance Committee. I will be making an appointment to fill Mr. Slaughter's seat after the 2015 annual town meeting is dissolved. I would like to thank Mr. Slaughter for his service on the committee. If you are interested in serving on the Finance Committee now or at any point in the future, please go to the town website and submit a citizen activity form. It's a tradition at this point to remember former town meeting members who have passed away since the last town meeting. There's no comprehensive list of former members, so if I've forgotten someone, please let me know and I will remember them in a subsequent session. Since we met last fall, we have lost George Richeson. Please rise if you are able, and let's have a moment of silence to remember our friends, neighbors, and public servants. Thank you. Quick schedule review, we meet next on Wednesday night, April 29th, and then next week on Monday the 4th, Wednesday the 6th, and the following week if we have not yet completed the town meeting. A um, Couple reminders from the moderator. First, having to do with the League of Women Voter publications. League of Women Voter and the town meeting coordinating committee provide four publications which are particularly useful to us and should be available on the back table if you already don't have a copy. One is your Amherst government, then the Town Meeting Handbook, Zoning Primer, and the They Represent You brochure. Please be sure to pick up the They Represent You brochure. It's a large, unfolded, printed sheet on a table in the back of the room. This is the first draft, and it is a list of all elected officials in Amherst and their contact information. It includes all town meeting members, elected, wide, elected town-wide boards, and finance committee members. Also pick up the sheet that tells you how to make corrections. The League needs to know whether the information listed for each person is correct before publishing the final version. 
If there is an error or omission in your listing, you need to go online to the league's website and correct the error, or fill out a correction slip at the bottom of the instruction sheet and put it in a box on the table in the back of the room. If your name appears more than once in They Represent You, be sure to note that in your correction too. Please send your corrections by Monday, May 4th. Um, quick note about tally cards. In your second town meeting packet, you received a set of red and green tally vote cards. These cards might be needed in any of the sessions of town meeting this spring, so please remember to bring your cards with you to all sessions. If you forgot your cards, please go to the check-in table now to get a blank set. You must write your name and precinct number on each card. Tally vote cards without names will not be counted. Even though you don't need to pick up new tally cards every night, you must check in every night of, every night of town meeting. Word about seating. The seats on the floor of the auditorium may be occupied only by town meeting members, except for the front row, which may be used by members of the press and by members of town committees and town staff participating in the presentation or discussion of articles. Such persons must wear non-voter stickers, which are available at the check-in table. The seats in front of me on the right are occupied by the select board, the town manager, the finance director, um, sometimes the town planner, but not currently, um, administrative assistant to the town manager's office, the assistant to the town manager, and an IT staff person. The finance committee is currently seated to my left. Spectators and town residents who are not town meeting members may be seated in the bleachers to the rear of the auditorium. New information for town meeting members can be found on the back table to my left over on that side. Old information can be found on the back table to my right. The Finance Committee report, which you have all received in the mail, is a valuable resource that you should take advantage of. It includes the complete town meeting schedule inside the front cover and an excellent glossary in the back. Amherst Media provides gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of our proceedings on public access television, and I'd like to thank their staff and volunteers. Videos of town meeting sessions are replayed frequently and can be viewed on the Amherst Media website. If you wish to speak, you must raise your hand and be recognized. When appropriate, please hold up green or red cards to indicate pro or con on the issue. When you are called on, first state your name and precinct. If you forget, I will interrupt and ask you to do so. If you need more than three minutes or more than five when making a motion, you must request additional time before speaking, and town meeting will vote on your request. If you are speaking from the floor, please speak into a microphone that will be provided once you are recognized. This will allow viewers outside of the auditorium to hear you. The microphone will be on when it is handed to you. Please hold it close to your mouth when you speak. Non-members who wish to speak should stand at the rear of the right-hand aisle, which is the one in front of me. Any registered member any registered voter of the town of Amherst who is recognized by the moderator may speak without special permission. Others may speak with the permission of a majority. Assisted listening devices are available for town meeting members at the soundboard in the back of the auditorium. And before I move on, speaking of microphones, I believe we just have one microphone wrangler and we really need a second one. So if there's somebody who would like to participate actively in town meeting, by racing around and handing microphones to people, it would be really appreciated. Is there anybody who would volunteer to do this important task? Yes, there we go. So you guys can work out who's on which side. Thank you very much. Motions and amendments. If you are making an amendment to a motion, the amendment must be presented in writing with four copies submitted to the front table. A copy machine is located at the end of the table to my right, which may be used to make copies of amendments. Procedural motions, such as a motion to refer or a motion to dismiss, do not need to be presented in writing. If you are making an amendment to a portion of the operating budget, please specify the dollar amount greater or less than the amount on the Finance Committee motion. If you make any motion from the floor, it must be the first thing you do after you have been recognized and have identified yourself. You cannot speak first and then make a motion. If you've not already done so, please silence your cell phone or turn it off. Reminder about the town meeting coordinating committee. 
The election of three members to the Town Meeting Coordinating Committee will take place during the fifth session of Town Meeting on May 11th. If you wish to be a member or if you wish to nominate someone else, nomination papers were included in your second Town Meeting packet and can also be downloaded from the Town website. The nomination deadline is May 5th. You can submit nomination papers and candidate statements here at Town Meeting or at the Town Clerk's Office. This is an important committee that is working hard to educate and inform town meeting members and to improve the process of town meeting. Please participate as a voter or as a candidate. Just a few more reminders, we're close to the end here. If at any point in time you are confused about the proceedings, it is appropriate to call a point of order and ask for a clarification. Also, it is always okay to phone me, send me an email, or see me prior to town meeting if you need an explanation of any kind. I will always try to call on people who have not yet spoken. I will not call on members by name, even if I know perfectly well who you are. I will interrupt speakers when your time is up and ask you to finish your current sentence. I will attempt to be consistent with all speakers and equally fair or unfair to all, but I will be inclined to give some deference to board and committee members, petitioners, and town employees. You all received a consent calendar and a cover letter in your second mailing. The consent calendar is about to be displayed before you on the screen. There it is, that's magic. I will now call out the consent calendar articles and motions. If you wish to remove an article from the consent calendar, call out remove and I will ask for a show of hands. If I see five hands, the article will be removed. There will be no debate on a removal of an article. Article two, transfer of funds, unpaid bills. The motion is to dismiss the article. Article three, acceptance of optional tax exemptions. Motion in terms of the article. Article four, authorization for compensating balance, balances. Motion in terms of the article. Article six, retirement assessment. Motion in terms of the article. Article seven, regional lockup assessment, motion in terms of the article. Article eight, other post-employment benefits, motion in terms of the article. Removed. I hear removed, do I see five hands for removal? I see plenty of hands, so article eight has been removed from the consent calendar. Article nine, revolving fund reauthorization, motion in terms of the article. Article 12, reserve fund, motion in terms of the article. I will now accept a motion from the select board to move all remaining warrant articles included in the consent calendar of the 2015 annual town meeting and the printed motions thereunder and approve those articles not removed as a single unit. So moved. Um, any, we need someone to second that? Yeah. I hear a second. We will now come to an immediate vote without debate on the remaining consent calendar motions. A majority vote is required for passage. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. All opposed, please say no. I hear a unanimous vote. And we now actually are moving on to Article 1. Let's see if I can find it here. Article 1. Um, and I should mention, when an article is short and concise, I will read it. When it is longer, I will just refer to it displayed on the screen, and obviously you should all have copies that you brought with you as well. Article one, reports of boards and committees. To see if the town will hear those reports of town officers, the finance committee, and any other town boards or committees which are not available in written form. And I need a motion under this article by Mr. Slaughter. I move in terms of the article. I hear a motion and a second. Mr. Slaughter, you may speak to your motion. Uh, as we uh, often do every town meeting, we, we uh, recommend, the select board recommends to the uh, acceptance of Article 1, which is the reports of boards committee that aren't written in written, aren't available in written form. That allows us to learn more about things that are coming before us. The select board unanimously recommends this to you. And Ms. Tileman for the Finance Committee. The Finance Committee unanimously recommends this article. Can people hear that okay? No, no. Yeah, I think you just have, you need to have your mouth closer to the mic. Oh, okay. The Finance Committee unanimously recommends this article for the same reasons as the Select Board. 
Thank you. And the voting requirement is a majority. Is there any discussion on this before we come to a vote? I see no hands. We will come to a vote. All those in favor of the motion in terms of the article under Article 1, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, please say no. The ayes have it unanimously. We have, I have a list of six reports that we're going to hear. Let me just go through them so you know what to expect. The Finance Committee will give a report when we reach um, Article 11. Um, there will be a town gown report, um, combined report by the chancellor and town manager, and that will happen on a determined date of May 11th, I believe. Um, and then we have the Transportation Plan Task Force will give a report, Public Shade Tree Committee will give a report, the library will give a report when we get to the library section of the budget, and the school will give a report when we get to the school section of the budget. So I now call on Richard Rosnoy to speak for the Transportation Plan Task Force. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. The town now has a transportation plan. I'm Richard Rosnoy, a co-chair of the town transportation plan task force, along with Charlie Moran, who's the other co-chair. Charlie can't be here tonight, and I think we're all sending our best thoughts and prayers to Charlie at home. Uh, I'd like to give a brief overview of the project. Um, the transportation plan emanates from the goals and objectives of the town master plan regarding transportation, section nine of the master plan. Objective number one of that section says specifically that the town is to create a coordinated plan for current and future transportation in Amherst. As a brief history of the project, you here in town meeting four years ago in May 2011 appropriated $50,000 for hiring a consultant to help develop a transportation plan. Thanks very much, by the way. The, a task force was appointed by the town manager later in 2011 and that task force began meeting in February 2012. The task force is comprised of six members, uh, who I might mention have been great to work with, and I thank them very much for uh, all of their work on this project. It's been a wonderful team. Of the six, two are from the Public Works Committee. That's Charlie Moran, who did major work in getting the plan to its finished product, and Christine Gray Mullen. There are two from Public Transportation and Bicycling Committee, Richard Fine and Eve Vogel, and there are two from Planning Board, Rob Crowner and me. Christine Brestrup, Senior planning, Planner from the Planning Department, uh, and Guilford Mooring, the Superintendent of Public Works, have provided staff support and input, and Connie Kruger has been our Select Board Liaison, working closely with us. In late 2012, we put on an RFP seeking consultants. We got zero responses. We were asking that too much be done for too little money. So we went back, revised the RFP, and just a year ago in spring, we selected Nelson Nygaard, a consultant from Boston, to work with us to draft the plan. Many of you might have been a part of, last October, something that we called Transportation Days, when representatives from Nelson Nygaard came to town, met with folks, did a walking tour, collected information. Since then, they have been working with the task force, compiling data, meeting, and developing the plan. We generally met on Mondays, the meetings were open in public meetings, and sometimes we had some uh, participation from uh, visitors. By April this year, we had a final draft of the plan identifying existing conditions, needs for the town in transportation, and recommendations or strategies, as they called it, for air all areas of transportation in the town, pedestrian, bicycle, vehicle, parking issues, and commercial needs. On April 8th, Nelson Nygaard had two presentations of the final draft of the plan at the Unitarian Universalist Meeting House. Uh, we were pleased with the turnout that evening and uh, the final version of the plan followed comments that were received at those sessions. The plan is online on the town's website and some limited printed copies are available in town offices. Uh, we'll put a few copies in the reference desks at the libraries in town. What happens now? The plan will be presented to the select board for acceptance. I believe that meeting is scheduled for May 4th. 
and to the planning board for incorporation into the town master plan. I think that meeting is scheduled for May 20th for those of you who want to uh, be at any of those meetings. Meanwhile, the select board and the town manager will be involved in discussions to determine how to implement recommendations from the plan. Some of those recommendations can be implemented pretty quickly and inexpensively. Some will require more work and some will certainly involve discussions about policy and how to allocate resources for capital projects. So as one phase of this project concludes, it's really a pivot point for moving into the future for transportation needs in town. Uh, by the way, I know parking is a great concern in town and this plan addresses it, but not completely or comprehensively and it was never meant to do so. The parking forums that have been occurring have had an eye toward this plan, but that issue will be addressed separately with recommendations from this plan made a part of it. So I encourage all of you interested in that issue to continue to participate in the process. We on the task force are excited about the future and are looking forward to using this information to improve transportation in town. If anybody has questions, you can feel free to contact me or anybody on the task force. Thanks for your time. Thank you. I now call on Henry Laffin for the Public Shade Tree Committee report. Well, thank you. Um, some of you know me as Henry the Juggler. I'm not going to juggle for you tonight. I'm also the chair of the Public Shade Tree Committee and a couple of people in the town meeting, uh, Nancy, Nanny, Nanny Burak and Melissa Perot are also on the Public Shade Tree Committee. As our uh, mission statement says, we preserve, protect, and promote trees in town. A lot of our work revolves around helping the tree warden. We meet with him regularly. He comes to our meetings. We discuss trees. We advise him when there's a tree removal request. But we do a lot more than that too. We do a lot of speaking and writing about trees and some of the other things we've done in the past year. Uh, Michael Hutton Woodland, one of our members, worked with the bid to put in some tree planters along Main Street on an area where there was no room to dig or plant trees. So we came up with a solution of planting in large planters, which the bid helped us purchase. Uh, Nancy Higgins works with people in different neighborhoods to select someone to be the ANTS group for the, week, for the year. ANTS is Amherst Neighborhood Tree Stewards. And what we do is every year we select one neighborhood and we do an intensive planting in that neighborhood. Last year we did Harris and Fisher Street and our committee along with many of the homeowners and residents there helped plant a lot of trees. Uh, Bob Irwin coordinates our first Saturday of the month planting. And this Saturday we'll be planting trees along the corner of Snell and Route 9, Snell Street and Route 9. And uh, you're certainly welcome to grab your shovels and come down and help us. Uh, Melissa Perot has been keeping an eye on commercial development and town, me town meetings and um, committees so that we have a chance ahead of time to know when something comes up that will affect trees. In the past, we've found out too late that those big developments have been approved and a lot of trees have to come down. Um, Nani borak has been doing a lot of letter writing and um, writing articles too to educate people about the importance of trees. And one other project I've been working on is uh, tomorrow we're going to be planting an orchard at the South Amherst campus of the high school. And we're working with uh, Karen Murphy, one of the teachers there, and the students and people from the committee who are going to be planting apples, Asian pears, persimmons, pawpaws, um, and raspberries. And the kids will help plant the trees, maintain the trees, and then they'll use the fruit to eat and also in their cooking class there. Um, so meanwhile, the town is finishing up planting the 2,000 trees that you guys thankfully gave us money to help plant. Uh, the three years have ended, but I think we have a fourth year because there were a lot of logistical problems. We didn't get all 2,000 in yet. Hopefully, we'll be close to that by the end of this year. And even though we're doing all this tree planting and making great strides to restore the canopy, uh, there's also a lot of trees being lost every year. And um, well, some of that's natural, but some of it's because of humans. Um, one big problem is, of course, road widening and sidewalk improvement. I think of Pine Street here. We lost quite a few trees. Um, another problem is uh, the utility companies doing enhanced tree pruning to keep the trees away from the power lines. And that's a great thing to do to keep our electricity on during the winter, but the result of losing a lot of trees is a problem. 
One good thing is we meet regularly with Calvin Lawton from uh, Eversource or Western Mass Electric, and uh, we discuss different trees and we try to come up with ideas of how to save the tree and keep the electric grid intact. And then the other thing is, even though we get lots of requests from homeowners to plant new trees in front of the house, we also get lots of requests for tree removals. People are enlarging the house, putting in driveways, or putting solar collectors on the roof. And solar collectors is another thing that we support, yet losing a large shade tree actually has a pretty strong negative benefit for the town and for the environment. So as you know, we've told you before and that you've heard, shade trees provide a huge ecological benefit. A lot of carbon storage, they clean the air, they filter the water, they prevent storm erosion and help uh, keep our storm drains from overflowing. And of course, they're beautiful and provide a lot of habitat too. So it's a real struggle to keep Amherst green and to keep these trees growing. We hope you'll support us in any articles that do come up and to think about trees the next time there's some development coming up. How will this development affect trees? That's not to say you shouldn't support the development, but just to think about trees ahead of time. So we hope you'll do that. And uh, just drive down the streets all over town and see all the new trees we've planted and imagine what that'll look like in 10 or 20 or 50 years. We've got a really good movement going and Northampton is now emulating us. And uh, thanks for all your support. And one last thing, if you'd like, uh, you're certainly welcome to come to any of our meetings. We usually meet the second Tuesday of the month at four o'clock at Town Hall. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you. Those are all the reports we're hearing at this time under Article 1. Articles 2, 3, and 4 have already been dealt with. So the next article on our agenda is Article 5. But before we begin Article 5, we have a special treat because the Finance Committee needs to have a little mini meeting right here at this moment in town meeting. So if you would bear with us, they will explain what's going on and proceed. This is the biggest group we've had for a meeting. Um, so, Go, can't you real okay. close to the mic? Our, Article 5 uh, is a budget amendment which appears in the annual um, town meeting uh, warrant, and it's used to reconcile needed budget changes. So the purpose for this brief meeting is to vote the dollar amount in Article 5A. Uh, we didn't have a chance to see that beforehand. It lacked a sum, and now we have the amount to put in that article, and the amount is $29,200. Um, I move that the Finance Committee recommend the article, which transfers a sum of $29,200 from general government to public safety. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? We, we have discussed this article previously, just without the money. Um, okay, so all in favor of, of this article, please, uh, please raise your hands. Okay, it's five. Is your hand up at the end? Sure. Okay, all right, it's five zero, um, and that's it. We're finished, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Just an extra treat, all for the price of admission. Okay, so now we are introducing Article 5. Um, part A of Article 5, to see if the town will amend the budget voted under Article 12 of the 2014 Annual Town Meeting, FY 2015 Operating Budget, to transfer sums of money between general government, public safety, public works, conservation and development, community service and debt service accounts to balance the 2015 fiscal year. Ms. Tomlin, do you have a motion? I move to amend the action taken under Article 12 of, uh, uh, all right. Read it off the script. Can read it and read okay. the yeah. use the microphone. Sure. Yeah, okay. Uh, I move to amend the action taken under Article 12 of the 2014 Annual Town Meeting Fiscal Year 2015 Operating Budget by increasing the appropriations and the amounts to be raised by taxation for the public safety account by 29200 and to meet such increased appropriation by decreasing the appropriation and the amount to be raised by taxation from general government by $29,200. And you may speak to your motion if there's more to say. Yes, thank you for the second. 
Article 5A calls for the um, FY15 transfer from general government to public safety to fund an anticipated settlement of the police supervisor's contract. This transfer will cover the amount of retro pay the town would have to pay for FY14 based on the offer the town made to the union. The town and the union are in arbitration and expect a ruling sometime this summer. This money needs to be set aside now so the town can pay it later. Uh, we recommend this article. And is there a statement from the select board, Ms. Brewer? Voted to recommend this article. Thank you. Um, this requires a majority vote. Is there further discussion before we come to a vote? I see a hand back center. I'm sorry. Please wait for a microphone. Microphone, hint, hint. There we go. Paige Wilder, Precinct and 10. And please, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, I'm just looking in the Finance Committee report, and it says that their, their report on this article will be deferred until town meeting. I'm wondering if there is one. Ms. Tomlin? Oh, we just gave it at, at, at this. Uh, we, didn't have a t we did not have time to write it up. Any other discussion before we come to a vote? I see no hands, so we will now come to a vote on the motion before you for Article 5, Part A. All those in favor, please. And I'm sorry, this is a majority vote required. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, please say no. I hear unanimous vote. Article 5, Part B, to see if the town will amend the action taken under Article 13 of the 2014 Annual Town Meeting FY 2015 Reserve Fund to appropriate and transfer a sum of money from the fund balance reserve for overlay surplus account to the reserve fund to balance the 2015 fiscal year. Ms. Tileman, do you have a motion? I move to amend the action taken under Article 13 of the 2014 Annual Town Meeting Fiscal Year uh, 15 operating budget by increasing the appropriation for the reserve fund account by $265,000 $497.76, and to meet such increased appropriation by transferring $265,497.76 from the fund balance reserved for overlay surplus account. Do I hear a second? I hear a second. You may speak to your motion. Okay. Uh, this is used uh, for the abatement that might be granted um, sometime this spring. Um, any money not needed uh, in this account is transferred to the reserve fund at the end of the fiscal year. And Ms. Brewer for the select board. Recommended to support this article. Thank you. Is there further discussion before, and this also requires a majority, is there further discussion before we come to a vote? I see no hands, so we will vote. All those in favor of the motion before you under Article 5, Part B, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, please say no. Ayes have it unanimously. Article 6 and Article 7 were both dealt with in the consent calendar, so we now move on to Article 8, which had been in the consent calendar and was removed. Article 8 to see if the town will raise an appropriate $200,000 for the OPEB trust fund established under the provisions of section 20 of chapter 32B of the Massachusetts general laws. And um, Mr. Sharma, do you have a motion? I am moving in terms of the article. Thank you, it's been made and seconded. You may speak to your motion. Uh, the OPEB is, uh, um, along with pension liabilities, the two largest liabilities for the town. Uh, currently, we are funding uh, the pension uh, on a pretty uh, good clip, um, and we are uh, funding uh, OPEB in a very uh, marginal way. The total liabilities for OPEB, these are future liabilities, so they depend upon the rate of discount you use. Uh, but depending on the rate of discount, the liabilities are anywhere from about um, uh, 52, about $52 million to about $94 million. 
um, these liabilities are expected to grow at the rate, in the long run rate of about 4.5% uh, per year, uh, which is the same as the assumed uh, rate of medical inflation. Uh, the town, uh, this is a pretty significant liability, and we are making uh, about $200,000, or exactly $200,000 contribution this year. Um, this contribution, even though small, is important because rating agencies such as Standard & Poor's uh, watched uh, that we are doing something about this. Uh, this is a, a statewide issue, uh, and the uh, Finance Committee, along with the st town staff, have been wrestling with this for quite a few years. Uh, the current plan, according to the town staff, is to uh, continue um, funding OPEB at a small um, at small amounts uh, and uh, keep track of it and the shift the, um, the pension funds, uh, the pension funds are supposed to be fully funded by about 2033 and the idea is at that point to shift the cash flows which are going into the pension fund right now into OPEB. Thank you. And um, what was the Finance Committee recommendation? I'm not sure if I heard you. Oh, I'm sorry. The Finance Committee recommendation was uh, 6 to 0 uh, in favor of the article. Thank you. Ms. Brewer for the Select Board. The Select Board also supported this article. Thank you. Um, the vote requirement is a majority. Is there discussion before we come to a vote? Yes, right there in the red. Hilda Greenbaum, Precinct 1. And I just have a bunch of questions. Um, $95,745 is a lot, a million dollars is a lot of money. And I guess the first question one would ask is, do we really need all that much money? Because I don't see how we're ever going to get there, raising 100000 to 200000 at a time. It sounds like we're taking the change out of our pockets and, and, you know, paying retirement out of piggy bank money. So I wish somebody would please explain the math to me. And my, my second question is, who is managing this money and how is it invested? Because you certainly can't put it in the bank, which doesn't even give zero percent. So thank you very much. Um, Mr. Pula or Mr. Masanti? Good evening, everybody. I've come up here to speak. This year, I don't have any glittery dollars or anything. This is just a straightforward talk. Um, the uh, questions you asked are excellent. Uh, the town of Amherst is in the same position as a lot, well, all communities in the Commonwealth in that um, we have a very large obligation to pay for the health insurance for our retirees. It's exactly the same type of uh, obligation as we have for pensions, and the state back in 1985 mandated for pensions that cities and towns start putting money aside and building it up so that when those pensions are due, the money is there. Um, back in 1985, there was probably an equally big number that people were looking at, but in fact, the system worked and the town of Amherst through the Hampshire County Retirement System started putting that money aside and eventually there will be enough money to, to cover that. On the health insurance side, it's a similar story. Amherst uh, has started putting money aside. Uh, I think we're uh, doing well compared to other communities and I think that's to the credit of town meeting and to the uh, leadership of the finance committee and the select board. Sometimes a big problem has to be taken one bite at a time. So the bites that we've taken so far are um, through, do, we first have done actuarial reports every two years where we look at what that liability is, the numbers that um, Mr. Sharma talked about. Um, if, so let me just say, we started doing that. 
Knowing how big that number was, a few years ago we started taking money um, and putting it aside when we could, when we had some extra state aid, when we had a health insurance premium holiday. So that uh, as of today, uh, we've got um, almost $2 million set aside in the trust fund for OPEP. That, those one-time opportunities were great, but the really important thing to get to a goal is to do it steadily. And uh, it's also very important to the uh, bond rating agencies that they see an ongoing plan. So um, last year, or at town meeting, we voted to put $100,000 in from the general fund budget. This year's proposal is 200000 I'm hoping that we'll be able to get to 300000 next year. At the same time, we have taken from those actuarial reports how much money we have to set aside from the water fund and the sewer fund, and this year for the first time for the transportation fund, and we've put the full amount, full annual contribution from those funds into the OPEB fund. So where is the OPEB fund? When uh, town meeting accepted section 20 of chapter 32B, which is the section of the general laws that allows cities and towns to set up OPEB funds. Part of what that section does is say, to say that there's a state fund, the same state fund that the state uses to invest its pension dollars that cities and towns can use for investing their um, OPEB funds. And we have been putting that money into those funds ever since, uh, well, it's been about a year and a half now that we built up enough to start putting it in there. It's been a good investment for the town. Uh, this year, our annual return from that fund has been about 7%, which these days is a very good return. Um, it, it is uh, managed by, as I say, the same people who manage the state pension fund, and I think they do an excellent job. So there is a long road ahead. Um, I think that the town has been prudent to try to take it one step at a time and to invest the money so that eventually it will grow enough that we will have all the funds necessary to pay the benefits that we've promised people. Thank you. Is there further discussion? Um, yes, way in the back there. Uh, Bear Tierkel, Precinct 4. Uh, I, thanks for the explanation of the cautious uh, approach to solving the 52 to $95 million problem. 200k at a time per year, uh, and it sounds like in 2033 we will begin making earnest payments on the promises we've made to our employees. Um, it worries me, or I, uh, it, of course this worries me, <laughs> uh, that we've made all these promises to the people who run our town, the people who work for our town, uh, promises that we don't have the money to pay. That in 2033, we think we will begin putting the money into. Um, I guess my question is, have we made any adjustments um, on the human resources side, which is, seems to be the source of, of OPEB liability, uh, any adjustments there so that we are not further incurring um, liabilities that we don't think we can start paying for 30 years. Um, Mr. So Poore, do you wish to speak? Yes, I do. Thank Mr. you, Poore. Mr. Moderator. Um, so just a clarification, yes, it won't be till 2033 that we're putting something like $5 million a year, but it is significant that we have started, and it does put us ahead of other communities, and that start has been noted uh, by Standard & Poor's in our bond rating, so it is a not insignificant step. Uh, the second part uh, uh, to answer your question is, yes, one of the things that you've heard in town meeting for the last couple of years is that the town, through its HR department uh, and through uh, working with our unions, has had an excellent record in keeping health insurance premiums level. We have not had an increase in our health insurance premiums, and in fact, this year we had a slight decrease in some of those premiums for the last five years. That is also and not insignificant. In fact, it's a very significant accomplishment. And there are a number of small steps that we've taken along the way so that 
in working with unions as you have to do, you take those small steps so that everybody agrees to it. And by doing it in a cooperative way, we have really bucked the trend and kept our health insurance costs level as opposed to the trend that you see most everywhere else. And we will continue to do that. I think doing it in that manner is effective and in the long run the right way to do it. Um, yes, right here, second row in the middle. Yes, uh, John Fox, Precinct 10. Um, <clears throat> it would be helpful, I think, in the next town meeting, the next spring town meeting, if you could give us a graph that would tell us <clears throat> what the liability is growing at. I think you said 4.5%, because over the next 18 years, that might be another $100 million. And that means that the real funding towards what would be close to $200 million doesn't begin for 18 years. Um, that is a, I'm sure it's a concern for you, too. It's not an easy problem. But it would be useful if we had a graph that showed the growth of the obligation with the funding towards that obligation. So we would see how the funding either meets the ongoing growth or fails to meet it, because it seems to me, <clears throat> as others have indicated, that the uncertainty over these 18 years creates a real risk that we may not be able to meet obligations that we take very seriously. I know you take very seriously. So I'd like to see a graph that would show the growth of the obligation with the funding towards that obligation as we move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there further discussion? Um, hang on a second. Yes, down here, second row. Uh, James Perrot, Precinct 1. Uh, um, my math may be off, but $52 million divided by 200,000 is about 260 years. Is there further discussion? Um, At some point, I'd like to make it. Okay. Um, yes, in the back corner there. Uh, Vince O'Connor, Precinct 1. Uh, could you tell us what our annual uh, payment for um, post-employment benefits um, consists of? How many dollars per year are we uh, paying out? And I don't know whether it would be the finance director or the gentleman from the finance committee who made the presentation. wonder if you could tell us what parameters are involved in <clears throat> the difference between 52 million and 95 million, and is one of those parameters um, the potential cost savings that might occur uh, from the adoption of a single payer health care system for Massachusetts? Mr. Poor, did you wish to respond? Uh, I'd be happy to. Did you wish to respond? Yes. Yes. Cool. Just coordinating here. Okay. Um, so, I'll answer your second question, well, i answer your second question first and then get to your first and third questions. Uh, the second question is that the difference between 52 million and 95 million is all about how much money we're putting aside right now, today, to meet this obligation. If we put just 200,000, or 200,000 plus the couple of other 100,000 that we put aside in the water and sewer funds. If we put that level aside every year, then what we owe in the long run is 95 million. If we do like some communities have done, for example, the town of Needham puts its full amount in that the, the actuaries say you should put in it every year. And just by the way, the full amount that is called an ARC so we're putting in the full arc for the water fund and the sewer fund and the transportation fund. If you were to put that amount aside, so you start funding earlier and more aggressively, then the long-term liability shrinks. And I'll explain that in one second very briefly. It goes down uh, to the uh, 52 million or whatever it is. 
That's because there's an assumed rate of return you can get on money that you've put aside. If you put aside money today and let it grow, they let you assume that it's going to grow at a rate sim similar to the stock market, the 7.75%. If you don't put much money aside now, it's not going to grow very much. It's not going to get to the point where it meets your liabilities. So that's why the more money you put aside now, in the long run, the less your liabilities. The less money you put aside now, the longer it's going to take to get there, your liabilities are bigger. That being said, right now we spend about $2 million every year on a cash pay-as-you-go basis for uh, retiree um, health insurance benefits. Um, and um, if we were able to fully fund our ARC every year, it would be about $4 million. So it would be about a $2 million increase. So really the game is to start building it up so we can get closer and closer to that four million and take care of our obligations. And finally, none of these numbers is um, reliant on or any way related to the type of health care system that we have, whether it's single payer or not. And finally, Mr. Moderator, I'd just like to say to people here, there are two very important sources of information about this issue that are online. The actuarial reports I was referring to are on the town webpage. They're under the accounting department. Um, if you were to go to the town webpage and search under the, the um, acronym OPEB, it's the first thing that comes up. So you can see it right there. And you can see all these numbers we've been talking about. Also on February 28th, 2015, at the, there was a meeting uh, where the actuary came and spoke. And you can find that on uh, Amherst Media. Again, if you go to Amherst Media's website and uh, Google OPEB, it's the first thing that comes up. And um, you can listen to an actuary talk for an hour about. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Is there further discussion? Um, yes, right there. Uh, Leo Maley, Precinct 5. So there's a policy question then. Uh, obviously the free cash and stabilization money was put to good use during the economic downturn. Uh, it dropped. This is found on page uh, 10 of the Finance Committee report. It was at a high of a little over 9 million. It dropped to a little under 4 million. It's now back to a little over 9 million. So the policy question is, what if you took a million out of that and popped it over into the, this liability? Because ultimately, the reserves are for upcoming liabilities. This is such an upcoming liability. How, do, how is that determination made? Mr. Poor? The town has uh, financial policies. They are also online. And one of the financial policies says that the reserves to which you referred should be between 5 and 15 percent of our budget every year. And so we are getting close to that 15 percent level now with that upswing. We're at 13.1 percent. Um, so once we get to the 15 percent, that's time to stop putting money into those reserves because we will have fulfilled the town's policies. And at that point, uh, it, we can redirect them to other things. In the meantime, we've had the discussion about how you start and how fast you get going, and with the Finance Committee having looked at this a couple of years ago, coming up with a policy to start with these chunks and build up, that was part of what came out of a subcommittee on the Finance Committee. Further discussion? Yes, right there, second row. Wait for the mic. <laughs> Uh, I would, my name's Ellie Manir Gotti, I'm Precinct 8. I would like to know exactly what's in the benefits and how are we paying them now? Mr. Poor? Um, retirees for the town of Amherst, most of them are in plans that are um, supplemental to Social Security. 
So the first payments for most of their uh, medical payments come from Social Security. Uh, if you have Social Security, you may know that Social Security doesn't cover everything. So there's a plan B and what's sort of known as wraparound payments from various products that you can buy, like medics out in, in the market. So we basically offer plans like that. And depending on whether that plan is an HMO, the plan, the town pays 80% of those benefits, or if it's something called the PPO, the town pays 75% of those and the employees pay the rest. So it is a supplemental plan to Social Security to allow people to have full medical coverage. Are we ready to come to a vote? Um, yes, right there. Marilyn Blaustein, Precinct 6. I call the previous question. Um, and just before I accept the motion, was there anybody else who wanted to discuss this? I see no hands, so with your permission, I'll withdraw your motion and we'll come to a vote. Great. We will now come to a vote on Article 8. The motion is in terms of the article, and it's before you. This requires a majority. All those in favor of the motion under Article 8, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, please say no. no. The ayes have it. <coughs> Article 9 has been dealt with in the consent calendar, so we are now moving on to Article 10. To see if the town will vote to approve following the existing Amherst Pelham Regional School District Agreement for allocating the total amount to be contributed by each member town of the district for fiscal year 2016 as required by section six of the regional agreement. And I call on Ms. Appy to make a motion, I think. Yes. I move in terms of the article and I hear a second. Thank you. You may speak to your motion. Uh, Sean Mangano, the director of finance for the schools, is going to make a statement. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Catherine. So the regional agreement assessment method allocates assessments to each member town based on each member or each community's proportion of a five-year rolling average of enrollment. This method, which has been used the past eight years, uh, was reviewed by a working group this summer and that working group was comprised of town officials from each member town. Uh, the working group unanimously recommended that the regional school committee continue using this assessment method, um, and their reasons were that it's highly predictable, easily explainable, and it's fair in the sense that each member town pays the same cost per student. Um, the full report from the working group is available on the school's website under FY16 budget. Thank you. His, um, I'm sorry. Let's see. For the Finance Committee, Ms. Powman. The Finance Committee recommends this motion, and it is uh, one that has been used a, a while, and it is also less volatile than the statutory method. So we strongly recommend you support this. Thank you. And Ms. Brewer for the Select Board. The Select Board also recommends your support. The town meetings in the other three partner towns will all take place on Saturday, and as of this evening, we believe that they will all pass this article. It is, it is required to be unanimous across all four towns. Thank you. This does require a majority vote. Is there discussion before we come to a vote? Um, yes, over there, fourth row back on my left. Uh, Jim Oldham, Precinct 5. Uh, I agree this seems like an equitable approach, and I understand I've heard similar explanations previous years. Uh, I think, though, that it would be appropriate for us as Amherst Town Meeting, looking at it from the point of view of Amherst, to at least know what the difference in cost to Amherst would be. Are we benefiting or losing out? On a, in a monetary way. I realize that there's more issues here than just what we pay, but, but I think that you know, the appropriate report to us should at least include that type of information. That is, if we were to go back to the statutory approach, 
would the bill to Amherst be more or less? Does it change year to year? Or have we been consistently subsidizing or consistently being subsidized by others? Thank you. Um, is there further discussion? Yes, go ahead. Let me come forward or speak I'll just there. respond to that question. I want you to identify yourself. I'm not sure everyone heard So I'm Sean Mangano, Director of Finance for the Regional Schools. So uh, this year, the difference between the regional agreement assessment amount and the statutory am amount is the regional agreement amount is $314,000 less than the statutory amount for Amherst. So this year, Amherst benefits from the regional agreement amount. It's not the case every year. It does switch back and forth for Amherst. Um, and in that report, I think it's in their report as a history of uh, what our actual assessment was and then what the assessment would have been under the statutory or the alternative method. Um, and if it's not there, we can put it on the website. Thank you. Is there further discussion before I come to a vote? Yes, I see a hand way over there, fifth row back. Um, my name is Janet McGowan, I'm Precinct 8. I was in a meeting on regionaliza regionalization and the costs to Amherst, and um, Mr. Pooler said that over the last 10 years, Amherst has paid millions, dollar, millions of dollars more um, by not going with the statutory method. I understand this is a good year for us or this past year, but what is the average that we pay more versus the Hill Towns over the past 10 years? Um, anybody care to respond to that? I guess not. Just to make it clear, um, folks can ask questions of boards or committees or petitioners, but no one is required to answer them. Um, general rule of town meeting. So is there further discussion before we come to a vote? Um, yes, I see a hand right here, second row. Wait for the mic, please. I just want, would like to know what and this... Identify yourself, please. I'm Ellie Manier Gotti again. Precinct date. I would just like to know what the what the statutory method is and how it makes a difference. Ms. Tileman, want to go for that one? Um, or Sean? <coughs> yes, back there. Sean Mangano, Director of Finance uh, for the schools. So the the major difference is the regional agreement. It's all based on enrollment. So every town pays the same cost per student based on enrollment. Under the statutory, it's primarily based on EQVs and income of the community. EQVs is the aggregated property values of the community. So if you know, a new development comes into Amherst, that would increase the EQV in Amherst, and their assessment would go up. Um, likewise, if for whatever reason property values went down, your EQV would go down and your assessment would go down. So statutory is based on property values and income. The regional agreement's based purely on enrollment. Ms. Tileman. And that varies every two years. Two years, I believe it is, for income, and three years for property values. The state looks at that, and they put that into the formula, and that determines that. And right now, one of the um, small towns has a, a, a wealthy landowner, and that really skews the statutory method. So over time, the idea of using the rolling five-year average is to level out those spikes. And yes, some years we help subsidize and some years we are subsidized. But having been on the school committee, it seemed that over time it pretty much works out. Um, also, the other thing is the uh, number of children that come into your community um, because we, we look at that as part of our, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the alternative uh, method. But it, but it is very interesting, and there is, I think we have a PowerPoint on the state formula, uh, Sean? Yeah, there's a PowerPoint on DESE's website under Finance uh, Chapter 70. There's a good PowerPoint by Roger Hatch, who was one of the creators of the, uh, the statutory formula. Um, it walks you through all the steps. It's, it's a complicated formula, which is one of the reasons why the working group said that the regional agreement method was easily explainable, because it's just enrollment. Thank you. Is there further discussion before we come to a vote? I see no hands. This is a majority required. All those in favor of the motion before you under Article 10, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, please say no. Moderator, here's a majority. 
We now move on to our Article 11, the FY 2016 Operating Budget, to see if the town will adopt a comprehensive operating budget for the ensuing year and raise appro an appropriate money therefore. And we will start off with hearing a report from the Finance Committee. Ms. Tileman. Uh, on behalf of uh, Ms. Moran, um, I am going to highlight the uh, sections of the Finance Committee report. Um, do we have the uh, slides? Okay. Uh, all right. <clears throat> the uh, Finance Committee presents to town meeting a budget for fiscal year 2016 that essentially provides the same services as in the current year. This uh, the level of services is sustainable for several more years if, as estimated, revenues continue to increase at modest rates, if employee health insurance costs don't rise drastically, and if the town restrains spending on new initiatives. There's two, can you see those pie charts? They're on page five in your yellow booklet. On the expenditures uh, pie, 44% of the town's total expenditures are for educating children. The red slice is for the elementary schools. The green slice is the town's regional school assessment. 26%, or the blue slice, represents the town budget, including public safety, public works, community services, conservation and development, and general government. Capital is the turquoise wedge, and that's the spending recommended by the Joint Capital Planning Committee for individual capital projects and for debt service payments on previous borrowing. The enterprise funds of 12% represent expenditures for the water, sewer, and solid waste, and it exactly matches the, uh, the slice on the revenue pie <clears throat> since those are self-supporting. Assessments are orange, and they include the town's annual payment to the Hampshire County Retirement Fund, which is Article 6, as well as the 200000 to be appropriated to OPEB, Article 8. <clears throat> the revenue pie chart. Um, the blue comes from local property taxes as a percentage that has grown over the last five years, and as the state age slice shrinks, that's 56%. Any increase of the property tax levy is limited to two and a half a year, plus new growth, which is property tax on newly constructed and renovated buildings. Other than a two and a half percent override, encouraging new growth through responsible development is the only significant way to increase local revenue. <clears throat> Other local revenues is shown by the red slice, which is 9%, and includes motor vehicle excise and the local hotel and meals taxes. Aid from the state, the green slice, is the second largest funding source and will provide 18% of the revenue for FY16. <clears throat> this spring, the House and Senate agreed on the budget amounts uh, for local aid, and it gave towns greater uh, budget predictability. Amherst State Aid will increase by 3% or about $431,000. Okay. <clears throat> then state aid levels go up and down with the economy and they are not uh, and are still not back to where they were in FY08. State aid has <clears throat> um, was reduced by 20% more than halfway through fiscal year 2009, resulting in a spending freeze. And six years ago, town meeting had to vote the FY10 budget. That was 1.4% lower than the previous years. And if you remember that, it required employee layoffs, cuts in services, and the use of 1.2 million from reserves to facilitate the closing of Mark's Meadow School. And uh, we had to wait until the hotel, motel, and meals taxes went into effect. Okay. The Finance Committee does not recommend using reserves to balance the FY16 budget. 
Reserves should be between 5 and 15 percent of the operating budget so that the town can sustain level services despite fluctuations in the economy and state aid. In fiscal years 06 and 10, reserves dipped perilously close to the bottom as shown on, on that chart which was referred to earlier. As of July 1, reserves stood at $9,152,345 or 13.1% of the total FY15 budget, which is a major reason for the excellent credit rating given the town earlier this year, and the rating is a double A plus. The Finance Committee believes that it is important for the town to have sufficient reserves so that it will have money available for emergencies, have some ability to protect services when the economic downturn, should it come again, and uh, also reductions in state aid. It is also important to be able to protect our credit rating, which results in lower interest rates on future borrowing for capital projects. Um, that's a brief overview. Um, you certainly have more details in the Finance Committee booklet. Thank you. I now call on the town manager to give his report, also under Article 1. Uh, good evening. Uh, uh, limited resources do not mean a limited vision, and the uh, recommended budget, uh, municipal budget that's before you tonight, uh, contains uh, four uh, initiatives that I think are necessary and uh, are quite bold. Uh, first, the town budget growth that's been recommended in this budget is 2.5%. Uh, and that is a smaller increase than the increase in the town budget uh, in each of the last three years. Um, Long-term planning and ongoing initiatives have reined in growing health insurance and other benefit costs and have delivered services in uh, a more cost-effective manner. Uh, and these economies, I think, make uh, these four uh, priority initiatives possible in this recommended budget. Uh, first, the recommended budget uh, adds two police officer positions to the Amherst Police Department, which restores two positions that had been cut several years ago. Uh, the police department has long embraced a community policing model, but has not been fully able to achieve our goal of proactive versus reactive policing because it lacks uh, the staff. I continue to monitor the workload of our public safety personnel uh, and staffing levels, particularly as these departments report uh, increasing call volume. Uh, for example, uh, the university has increased enrollment by about 16 percent over the last 10 years, uh, while over that same period the police department staffing has decreased by five uh, sworn positions since 2007. Uh, second, the recommended budget includes funding for the town to hire an economic development director uh, last year, uh, when I presented the budget to the select board, I said that if the town had more revenue, my first priority would have been to create an economic development director position. Uh, this recommendation was echoed last fall uh, in the UMass Town of Amherst Town Gown Study. Uh, over the last 30 years, the town has not figured out how to successfully and sustainably partner with UMass and the private sector to leverage the world-class research taking place on campus uh, toward economic growth and jobs off campus in Amherst. Uh, reasonable and sustainable development that respects Amherst's values and history is essential. Uh, third, good customer service uh, uh, all of us think are fundamental to good government. Uh, the department that perhaps is most often contacted uh, by the public is our Department of Public Works. Uh, the recommended budget includes the addition of a DPW administrative analyst position, which will both provide additional staff support to respond to residents' questions, and more importantly, work on systems uh, internally and externally to push information out uh, to our customers before they have to make uh, a call to the DPW. Uh, and fourth, uh, the recommended budget strengthens the coordination and delivery of health 
senior citizen veterans and other human services by expanding the health director's responsibilities to that of community services director at the Banks Community Center. Uh, a reorganization of the health department moves its two uh, inspectors uh, to the inspection services department at Town Hall, which will provide an integrated one-stop service to residents, businesses, and contractors. Uh, Mrs. Bang's donation to the town of the land for the Bang's Community Center anticipated uh, that it would be used for health purposes. I am working closely with the Hilltown Community Health Center, Cooley Dickinson Hospital, uh, and many area service, uh, human service agencies and hope to be able to announce soon the siting of a satellite uh, community health center uh, clinic in the lower level of the Bangs. It will fill a demonstrated community need for primary care, including dental, for seniors, veterans, and other underserved uh, populations. And I'll just close by thanking uh, all of you in town meeting for your uh, longstanding support of uh, the work uh, that town employees do uh, on behalf of the people of Amherst. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, we will play a little musical chairs, and the library trustees and director will replace the select board and town manager at the front table to my right. Everyone else can talk amongst yourselves. Before we, before we begin with library services, I just want to I just want to briefly discuss how we're going to be handling the different sections under Article 11 because it's a little different than our other warrant articles. First of all, any motions to increase or decrease dollar amounts under Article 11 sections must be made in terms of the bottom line. You can explain the intent of your motion, but town meeting only votes on the bottom line. So your motion must specify the dollar amount greater or less than the amount in the Finance Committee motion. I will accept multiple motions. If there are multiple motions on the floor for different dollar amounts, we will vote on the highest dollar amount first. We will discuss line items and sections of each budget area as they appear in the Finance Committee booklet. But the vote is only on the bottom line. We will first quickly go through all sections to see if there are questions from the floor. While we do this, I will not accept a motion for the previous question. After we have reviewed all sections, members are free to be recognized for debate, opinions, etc. If there's any questions on how this goes as we proceed, please make a point of order and ask. Otherwise, we can now move on with the report from the library director. Hi, everybody. Regarding the library's FY16 operating budget, I'm Sharon Sherry, the library director, sorry. Uh, I'm happy to say that it's pretty uneventful. Regarding our expenses for personnel costs, we're expecting a 2% increase, no additional positions or big changes. For circulating materials costs, we'll see about a 3% increase. When our town appropriation goes up, so does the amount of money that we have to spend on books in order to remain certified. So we'll have to spend $204,000 on circulating materials for FY16. 
And for our operations budget, we're looking at less than a half of a percent uh, increase. And our goal is simply to maintain level services. Regarding our income, we are requesting a 2.5% increase in our town appropriation so that we can maintain level services. We are expecting to receive approximately $80,000 in state aid for FY16. We use this money to cover the salaries that the town appropriation does not cover. The endowment draw rate will be decreasing to 4% for FY16. This is the third and final cut in a row of almost $40,000 each. And this is the best way to ensure that our endowment lives on in perpetuity. To date, we have raised $52,000 from our annual fund drive. Uh, this total does not include the amount we will receive when we mail our second annual fund letter in May. So we know this total will increase. We would be lost without the friends of the Jones Library System. This hardworking, passionate group donates over $30,000 a year towards library programming and materials. We will also be requiring, relying quite heavily on our reserving gift funds as our endowment draw rate drops this one last time. So in order to boost the balance of these funds, we are continuing to increase our fundraising activities, including mailing two annual fund letters each year, selling more merchandise, and holding our annual signature fundraising event, the Sammies. This year, we just honored local author Julius Lester and Pat and Peter Schneider of Amherst Writers and Artists. And through underwriting, advertising sales, and ticket prices, we raised about $15,000. So that's it for the budget. I wanted to give you a quick update on the status of our planning and design grant. The library's uh, next five-year plan will be approved by the trustees in May. We will complete our building program and hire an owner's project manager in June. And then during the summer, we'll hire an architect. We will also establish a capital campaign committee this summer. The terms of the grant require that we complete schematics and obtain a cost estimate by October of 2016. Thus, we'll have a little over a year to design a renovated building. We are also expecting the public library construction grant round to be announced in the fall of 2016. So we're in, uh, our ducks are in a row and we're, good timing. Uh, currently, as part of the renovation design process, the library is looking at possibly connecting itself organizationally and maybe physically with the Amherst Historical Society. If all the legal and financial details can be worked out, the two buildings could be connected, giving, the great, giving greater access to the society's collection and giving the library a larger lot of land to expand onto. Representatives from the library and the town and the society have met with town council where we talked about real estate transactions and a memorandum of understanding. Right now we're very much in the investigative phase of this project um, and much still needs to be discussed. But I just want you to know that these discussions are taking place. What I'm most excited to talk about is that the town's planning department worked with the library trustees in order to complete a site analysis for planning and design. And based on several criteria, including proximity to town center, the plot size, the cost, proximity to public transportation, the results of the analysis state that the best location for the Jones Library is in its current location at 43 Amity Street. The board has approved this analysis, uh, which is available on the library's website, and now we have enough data to prove to the state, the Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners, that it doesn't make sense for us to renovate or build somewhere else. Um, so we're really ha happy about that. Uh, that's, that's it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And now um, I'd like a motion from, the, from Ms. Ratner, I believe. I move that the town approve the library services operating budget of $2,411,805. And that the town raise and appropriate $1,833,246 as its share of that budget. I hear a second. You may speak to your motion. The library services budget for FY16, as you heard, is $2,411,805, an increase of $42,213, or 1.8% from FY15. 
The town tax support for FY16 is $1,833,246, an increase of $44,713, or 2.5% from FY15. The Finance Committee recommended this budget by a vote of 6 to 0, with one vacancy. Library services are provided to Jones Library, the North Amherst Library, and the Munson Memorial Library in South Amherst. The Jones Library building is owned by the Jones Library Incorporated, which is governed by the Jones Library trustees. The town owns the North Amherst and Munson Library buildings, and most maintenance expenses for these buildings are found in the town's facilities maintenance and public works budgets. The library budget has several sources of funding, uh, which you can see up on the screen. Approximately 76% of support for this budget comes from the town appropriation. That's the blue slice. And this appro appropriation increases 2.5% this year. The Jones Library Endowment will be contributing $292,796 for FY16, a decrease of 11.2% from last year. Um, in this budget, as Ms. Shari indicated, the spending rate from the endowment decle declines to 4%. This is a spending rate that investment managers have advised the library trustees to use to preserve the endowment for perpetuity. Library state aid and support from the Jones Library Annual Fund and Friends of the Jones Library are expected to remain about the same. Support from gifts, grants, and reserves is expected to increase about 67%. That's in the turquoise section. And the, um, let's see, okay. Um, to receive state aid, there are several minimum requirements for towns and libraries. Municipalities must fund their libraries at certain levels based on formulas. Libraries must spend a certain percentage of their budgets on materials. And libraries must be open a certain number of hours. Amherst libraries meet all of the necessary requirements. The number of full-time equivalent employees in the FY16 budget is 26.9 unchanged from FY15. Thank you. Thank you. And now, um, Mr. Surratt, I believe, statement for the library trustees. The library trustees uh, unanimously endorse this budget uh, proposal. Uh, we want you to note that in the pie chart of town expenditures, uh, the town's 2% uh, of the town's expenditures go to the library. Uh, we continue to think that the value added to the town far exceeds that uh, 2%. Thank you. And now for the select board, Mr. Slaughter is out there somewhere. There you are. Is it on? Oh, it is now. All right. The select board recommends the library budget to you as well. Thank you. Um, the requirement. Um, for approval is a majority vote. And as I said, I'm going to quickly go through the line items, which I'm looking at page 20 of the Finance Committee report. So if you have specific questions or issues with a line item, now's the time to say so. After you go through quickly, I will open it to general discussion. So anything on personnel services? Yes, over there in the middle of the left side. Jim Oldham, Precinct 5. Uh, I think this is probably the right time to raise this question. Uh, and it is a question, rather. Um, so as, as was noted, the library has uh, 17 full-time and 12 close to full-time, part-time with benefit employees, and, and 31 part-time with no benefits. And, and so my question to, to the director or, or the board members who, who might want to speak to it is, what strategies, if any, do you have to, to move toward uh, a situation where more of the library employees would be able to uh, benefit from, from benefits? Uh, what, uh, are there any strategies uh, in terms of uh, as people leave uh, offering uh, additional hours to any part-time employees who might want them? Are there any other uh, planning around that? Or conversely, is there any strategy ex explicitly in place to preclude that type of change? That is, is, it, is there an intent to stay uh, with a high number of part-time uh, employees who, who do not qualify for benefits? Ms. Sherry? Hi. Um, well, 
I'm not sure how to answer that. Um, the only way we would be able to hire more full-time people would be from with a larger town appropriation. Anybody else want to say anything else? Any more on personnel services? Moving on to employee benefits. See no hands there. Circulating materials. Operations. No hands. Under source of funds, town appropriation, library state aid, um, endowments, Jones Library endowment. Yes, I see a hand there. John Cool, Precinct 2. Under uh, library state aid, I read that the state aid has remained the same, and on the listing and the budget, I see that it is. 30,000 as opposed to 40,000 last year. Am I missing something? Ms. Sherry? When, when the library submits its budget request, it's an, in essence a, a, almost a year in advance of town meeting. Um, so it's a guesstimate. And, and so the reality is it's, it's closer to 30,000. Anything else on state aid? Anything on the endowment? Um, yes, I see a hand there. Um, Hilda Greenbaum, Precinct 1. How much is the endowment now? Because the market has been doing pretty well the last couple of years. Last year, anyway. Um, somebody, um, Ms. Sherry? I think it's about 7.5. I don't have the exact figure on me. 7.5 million. Anything on Woodbury funds? Building expansion and renovation. Um, special collections, annual fund drive, um, replacement lost books, friends donation books, um, friends donation programs, um, gifts, grants, reserves, etc. Okay, we're open just to general discussion, anything at all. Um, yes, I see a hand there in the, the throw back on the aisle. Nope, nope, this one right here in front. Yes. Yes. Uh, Mary Wentworth, Precinct 5. Uh, I want to follow up on the answer to the question about the uh, number of part-time employees who work at the library uh, without um, any benefits. Um, I understand from the library director's reply that our town library couldn't operate without this super exploitation of workers in our community. Um, that seems really uh, reprehensible practice to me that perhaps we who yeah. are patrons of the library. Uh, uh, excuse me. Sorry to interrupt. There's been a point of order. And yes, I'm listening carefully, and I'm close, but not quite there yet. Uh, you may continue. I'm, I'm sure that a lot of patrons of the library are unaware of this uh, situation. Further discussion before we come to a vote? Um, yes, all the way in the back there in the middle. Uh, Richard Morse, Precinct 7. I know that the library has a still underutilized pro volunteer program that involves uh, delivering books and other materials to homebound people, people who are um, unable to get to the library either during some or all of the, of the year. That, and this is an instance in which the, uh, the library comes to you rather than you go into the library. And that's a program that remains underutilized because I don't know that enough people know about it, but more people should. Thank you. Thank you. Um, right there in the center, second row. Jerry what? Hello, Jerry Weiss, Precinct 8. Uh, this is not a budget question, but since the expansion was brought up, I thought this might be a good time to have someone uh, elaborate on or put to rest the rumor that the uh, garden will be paved for a parking lot. Um, 
Anybody in the front want to speak to that? Ms. Sherry. Um, gosh, I hope not. No. Uh, and in fact, with our discussions with the Historic Society and the Strong House, depending on more prop how much more property we can um, get, then the more green space we'll be able to save. But certainly that's one of our priorities, is maintaining that green space in the center of town. We're kind of hoping that parking problems will be solved in a different way. Further discussion before a vote? Um, yes, second row from the back on the aisle. Uh, Michael Bertwistle, Precinct 2. Um, I was going to ask this question uh, when you went down the list, but you missed my hand. Uh, I'd like to know why gifts, grants, and reserves is expected to increase by 66.8%. Uh, it seems like a large increase for a relatively small amount. Ms. Sherry? Well, uh, our reliance on our gifts and reserves is increasing because we've lost $120,000 over the past three years. So once our endowment draw uh, basically starts to increase again, then we will be able to rely less on uh, our, our reserves. Does that make sense? Um. Further discussion? Yes, over there, for throwback. Jim Oldham, Precinct 5. Uh, following up my previous question and, and the director's answer, uh, I understood you to say that without additional funds from town meeting, additional appropriations, the library is unable to, to provide uh, more jobs with benefits. Uh, I certainly, speaking as one of very many town meeting members, but uh, for myself, uh, I would welcome seeing a, a budget proposal next year that didn't rely entirely on town funds, but, but came to us uh, with a strategy to move toward a situation where, where the workers are paid uh, and, and given benefits uh, more in line with what I think we've come to expect for our town employees as opposed to what you might expect in, in a big box store. And uh, again, I, I would, it, the budget starts with you folks, it doesn't start with us. So let's work together and see if the library can, can treat its employee as well. Thank you. Mr. Schrott. So I just want to be clear, what we've asked the library director to do, what we've asked the library director to do after the budget year is over is to begin, in fact, to study the process of how we might move in the direction that you've uh, described. I don't want to promise that that study is going to be resolved by the next budget year, but I want it clear to town meeting that we are going to be looking at the question, including the question of what it will do to the library's finances and where the money might come from. And I'm thrilled that town meeting is at least one town meeting member. Well, do a lot of talking, Jim. Uh, is, is willing to think with us about how to increase the library budget to provide more benefited positions. We weren't ready at this point. We may not be ready next year, but we are going to study it, and I welcome your participation in that conversation. Thank you. Is there further discussion? Um, yes, back there, third row from the back. Uh, Louis Greenbaum, Precinct 1. <clears throat> I think I understood rather clearly, hopefully clearly, uh, what the representatives from the library mean by garden. If they're talking about the beautiful, beautiful flowers and shrubs and bushes that have been uh, brought to the site and meticulously uh, cared for, that's one thing. But I am uh, equally concerned about uh, a facility that has no like in this community. And I mean to the beautiful, beautiful tree garden that exists in the rear of the main building uh, provided by Carol Pope in honor of her late husband, David Kinsey. So I need to ask, what is the, what is the position that your expansionist plans might have to maintain the integrity and the beauty of that facility. Anybody care to answer that from the front? Mr. Surratt. So 
the answer to the question is uh, none of us are expansionists. What we're doing is we're studying the possibility of expansion. That's number one. And number two, anything that we do to expand the library or renovate the library will be done in a way which we expect will fully respect the values that you've just articulated. Further discussion before we come to a vote? I think I see no hands. Oh, I see a hand. Yes. Uh, Vince O'Connor, Precinct 1. So I, I have a comment and then a question. Uh, the comment is about the, um, the availability of parking and uh, the library's um, advertising of, of parking availability. As I go to CVS occasionally, I see many spaces um, available in the town part of that parking lot, um, vastly underutilized. And I wonder if the library has as I think some businesses in town have done already, um, some program both on its website and, and some of its publications and maybe even a inside the library board uh, and hopefully improve signage by the town, um, but explaining where people who come to the library by automobile and not familiar with the downtown uh, can park. Uh, so that that's the comment. I hope that and, and if you do have something, if you want to respond to it, that would be good. Um, with respect to the question, um, I don't know how many, what your employee turnover is per year. It, it doesn't appear to be a, a large amount. I do notice that there has been um, an increased diversity on your staffing, which, um, which hopefully um, will continue. And I just wondered, what, what do, the tr do the trustees have a policy and the library director have uh, activities related to who do you uh, reach out to uh, to, uh, to find employees who, who might give the library employees a, a little, um, that they're rep more representative of the clientele and the, and the townspeople who use the library and people from other towns as well. What, who do you contact? Um, what, what outlets do you use? How, how do you, um, what is your policy about trying to recruit a more diverse workforce for the library? Ms. Sherry? We, uh, because we're town employees, we advertise through uh, the town's HR department. So we're reaching out to all the same places that all of the other town departments are. And certainly we encourage uh, um, uh, diverse applicants. Um, I guess I guess that's my answer. Are we ready to come to a vote? I see no hands, so let's come to a vote. This is a majority vote. If we can get the motion back up on the screen. All those in favor of the motion before you for the library services portion of the 2016 operating budget, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, please say no. The ayes have it. Library trustees and director may go back to your other seats and select board and town manager, come back.
We're now continuing with the community surface services portion of the budget. I call on Mr. Kubiak to make a motion. Moderator, I move the town raise an appropriate $1,724,276 for community services. I hear a second. You may speak to your motion. I'll refer everyone to page 23 in the Finance Committee report, which outlines this in more detail. Um, this budget represents 3% of the general fund operating budgets for the town, and this year is, it has an overall decrease of 9.4% in the budget from the current fiscal year. A couple of the initiatives the town manager referred to in his introduction, his dis discussion of the budget, are reflected here. Uh, one is that the health services uh, uh, director will become the community services director, an expanded role to participate in new program development as described by the manager. And um, secondly, uh, two positions, a health inspector and an assistant sanitarian will move from the uh, health department to the inspections department, and you'll hear a little bit more about that later. So that's, that accounts for part of the decrease in the budget. Another part of the decrease in the budget is at 125, uh, the uh, social services budget, which was $125,000 last year, it's been reduced to 20,000. That's because of a community development block grant, mini, mini, mini entitlement grant um, has boosted that spending to 165,000. So the 20,000 remaining in this budget will be for items that are not covered by the CDBG monies. So overall social service uh, uh, spending is increased, but that's driven by the grants. The senior center budget reflects some changes and as much as the town's trying to move away from uh, trying to use more of the state grant money to purchase social services. So some additional funds will go to that budget to help increase uh, the, uh, the share, the town share, the administrative assistant position. Uh, there's essentially no changes in the uh, in the other departments covered under here, veteran services and leisure, uh, leisure services, leisure services uh, is essentially a cost of living adjustment. Thank you very much. And did you give the Finance Committee recommendation? Finance Committee recommends this, uh, gave a unanimous recommendation to this budget. Thank you. And Mr. Steinberg for the Select Board. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm going to speak to this motion, and as I do so, as you'll find out on uh, the next nine motions that are going to be offered on the budget. Um, I wanted to speak very briefly, though, about process that the uh, select board's involvement in the budget process, because uh, you've heard the term guidelines. Uh, many times the Finance Committee, of course, establishes guidelines that provide guidance for the entire process and for the town manager, the superintendent, and library director about uh, development of budgets. The select board also works on guidelines that are um, to provide guidance to the town manager uh, regarding the development of the municipal budget and are largely discussions of financial policy and priorities within the uh, municipal function. Um, the uh, town manager then in January presents um, his uh, proposed budget and uh, the budget covers all of the functions of municipal government including uh, the enterprise funds. Um, we're very pleased, of course, to have the opportunity to provide that input and uh, the budget that was presented by the town manager um, reflects the um, input that we have provided to him. And uh, some of the things that he's discussed and that Mr. Kubiak referred to in the way of uh, new initiatives are entirely consistent with um, the guidance that we provided uh, and uh, so that uh, we're very pleased uh, to be able to support uh, all, uh, the budget for all of those reasons. Um, and that includes the two additional police officers, the additional position public works, the economic development director, and the reorganization within the community development department. The select board voted five to zero on March 23rd to support the municipal budget motions. 
that include, as I just noted, the enterprise funds. It also includes debt service, which is why it's t a total of 10 motions. And uh, so with that, I'll just note that uh, I've, I will ask that the moderator please just remind uh, town meeting in subsequent motions that uh, the select board has unanimously supported each of those motions. And thank you. Thank you. And the vote requirement for this is a majority. And as with the previous section of the budget, I will go through the line items, looking for specific questions, and then there'll be general discussion. And I'm looking at page 23 of the Finance Committee report. So for the public health line item, any questions? See nothing. Um, senior center? Yes, third row center. Gordon, pre precinct six. Um, I'm just curious about the growth of the, um, however you want to spell it, the elderly in this community, either by li uh, living in place or the uh, communities aimed towards the seniors and how that affects the senior center. Anybody want to respond to that? Mr. Prasanti. Uh, uh, you're right, uh, the demographic trends uh, uh, will continue to show a greater number of seniors living in the community. Uh, for purposes of the recommended budget, uh, this is the second year of a three-year transition to allow town funding uh, to support uh, a social worker position to uh, begin to meet those growing needs. Uh, that effort has been helped uh, substantially uh, from fundraising by the Friends of the Senior Center and over a three-year period, this will be year two, uh, increasing the town share of that position in order to uh, allow the Friends money to be used for other, other needs of the Senior Center. Any other questions on Senior Center? Veteran Services? Um, social services, yes, front row over on the left. Thank you. Uh, Rob Kessner, Precinct 3. This is uh, two, two questions, or really one question and one question slash comment. Um, the CDBG mini entitlement grant, uh, do we know the duration of that again or the expectation for that? That's the first question. The second one is that given that over the last few years we've gone from either funding it directly by taxation or through the grant, I'm curious whether um, the budget could include the amount that we're actually planning to expend but simply list the source of revenue from the uh, CDBG rather than uh, having the amount switch back and forth. And if that's not possible, I'm curious why we, why we, we don't account for it that way. So th thank you for answering those if you're willing to. Uh, Mr. Masanti? Uh, yeah, the, 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 the short answer on the second question is because it's not, it's just not a practice to appropriate funds from a federal grant. Uh, the uh, publication of what those uh, funds are used for are contained in the uh, report to me from the CDBG Advisory Committee, which is uh, posted on the town uh, webpage. Um, we are once again a mini entitlement community. Uh, every couple of years, the state reviews the criteria uh, to determine our status, and uh, we don't expect for the we don't expect that review to happen again for another couple of years. It's an imprecise science, but we expect to be a mini entitlement community uh, over the next couple of years. I can tell you that in total, uh, the amount of funding, both local and uh, through the CDBG grant for social services needs, for example, is going up about 50 percent compared to what was appropriated entirely from town funds uh, last year. There's $165,000 allocated uh, in the uh, CDBG application that has gone into the state uh, for five uh, human services uh, uh, programs. Uh, uh, there's 20000 in the town budget, and that's for the emergency funds a program, uh, a program we determined we would not be able to uh, successfully submit for CDBG funding because we'd have this supplanting issue 
uh, that would raise its ugly head. Uh, so we kept that money in the town budget and we were able to uh, supplement that with 165,000 from the block grant to uh, increase our, our, our support. Thank you. Anything else on social services? <clears throat> Moving on to leisure services. I'm sorry. Do we have a hand back there on social services? Yes. Yes, OK, I'm sorry. Uh, Carol Gray, Precinct 7. Um, I'm really glad to hear about the, uh, the, the senior center person being funded, the social work. That I, I'm glad to hear our town's doing that. I also was wondering about uh, some years ago, we had the Cambodian outreach worker position. And I remember in a tough budget year, it wasn't renewed. I'm wondering. Um, is that still not happening, the Cambodian outreach worker? And how much did that cost? That How much more would it cost to have that position again? Anybody wish to speak to that, Mr. Masanti? Or? I'd, I'd ask uh, Julie Fetterman, our health director. She might have some background on that. Um, I'm Julie Fetterman. I'm the health director. We had a half-time Cambodian outreach worker in her most recent iteration, and that position has been gone now. I believe we're headed into the third fiscal year without that position. Um, the position was funded through grant funds. Um, there was an agency called Kamai Health Advocates that was located in uh, northern Connecticut. That agency was completely funded with federal funds called REACH funds. Those funds across the country have mostly dried up. When that happened, um, the agency completely lost its funding, um, an agency that had existed for many years. So... Um, well, thank you, Carol. I'm just um, trying to go back in my mind so I get that number completely accurate. I wasn't um, prepared for that, but I believe that the number was in the neighborhood of $30,000. 26000 Thank you, HR. Um, <laughs> okay. Thank you. Anything else on social services? And we'll move on to lead. I'm sorry, okay. Yes, over there, third row. Yes, in the red. Amy Middleman, Precinct 5. I didn't see any mention of any funding for Craig's Doors, and I thought that was our highest social services commitment. So could someone explain that to me, please? Mr. Masanti? Uh, in the current fiscal year, uh, the operating costs to run the Craig's Doors uh, uh, programming, most, the largest of which is the homeless shelter, uh, is entirely supported from uh, uh, new money in the state budget, uh, totaling 200000 plus uh, some United Way funding, plus uh, some substantial private fundraising. Uh, there was town money uh, uh, included in the uh, appropriation last year. Uh, effectively, those dollars were used uh, to allow the uh, Craig's Doors group to uh, install a trailer on site at the First Baptist Church from which they are serving meals and uh, providing some initial intake and counseling uh, to members. So the, uh, uh, they are pursuing uh, equivalent funding once again through the state budget process for the coming year. Thank you. And yes, fourth row back in the middle there.
Mr. Moderator, I, I move to increase the community services budget by 105,000 for a total bottom line of $1,829,276. I hear a second. Um, you should actually introduce yourself and then you may speak to your motion. Jim Oldham, Precinct 5. Um, I'm proposing to reinstate the 105,000 to, to match the uh, equivalent that was funded last year. Human services or social services have historically was uh, something that Amherst Town Meeting funded for many years. Uh, back when we got a block grant uh, under a previous town manager, the choice uh, was made by the manager to propose in town meeting, accept the proposal to to reduce and, and eventually eliminate this line item uh, on the assumption that the block grant replaced it. Uh, I don't want to get into the technicalities of whether or not in this case we're, we, we appear to technically not be supplanting, I trust the manager on that, but in principle, to my reading, a uh, block grant is intended to help the community and help in particular because we have low-income people, because we have a population that has extra needs. So to withdraw 100000 that we've previously been spending because we got 160 over there means the, out of the 160 that we gained from the block grant, only 60000 is really increasing our ability to support the types of services uh, and populations that that block grant money is intended for. So I believe that we should go back to the uh, many years of uh, the practice of many years of town meeting, uh, keeping a budget line and keeping uh, steady funding from our own pocket for social services. And when our population is such that we qualify for federal funding, uh, the block grant funding, we should take advantage of that extra money to provide for extra needs. And I would like to um, point out that, you know, sometimes we get grants for the police or the planning department gets grants, uh, and we don't subtract that amount from their budgets. We use that money for those extra needs that those grants are intended to, to support. And we should be doing the same thing for social services. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to actually move on to the line items, and after we get through them and open it up to general discussion, people can come back to this. Although, actually, before that, I should ask if any committees want to speak to that motion. I don't know if you want to now or want to wait till later. We'll wait till later. Um, any, um, any questions or issues with the leisure services and supplemental education portion of the budget? I see no hands and, okay, yes. Vince O'Connor, Precinct 1. I uh, want to state two facts of our town's situation uh, before I ask the question uh, that will hopefully somebody from uh, will answer. Um, the first is that according to the U.S. Census, um, and, and that was as of 2010, we had lost 40% of the families in this town between 1990 and 2010. The second is that our leisure service program fees are absolutely the highest in, in, in this area. And in fact, they match the fees of many uh, colleges, public and private, that conduct programs, that have programs that are conducted by their um, Division three and Division one basketball coaches and other coaches. Um, so having stated that, um, I understood that um, last fall, and I participated in the discussions with the Leisure Services Commission, that the commission was going to make a request to the town manager that, the, um, that additional funds be made available both to subsidize the uh, Leisure Services programs for children from low-income families, and also uh, for funds to reduce the, the top-level cost, which, uh, which is um, the, the only children who can qualify for 
and families who can qualify for the subsidies are ones that meet the free and reduced lunch requirements, which are, um, the, the requirements are very low in terms of, you know, your income. Once you're over 20, 25,000, um, you're, you're paying the top fee, and um, just depending on family size. And so my concern is that the re my understanding of the request was going to be made, I would like to know what was the request made and what was the outcome of that request? Um, because my understanding is that there are no additional funds being provided uh, to the leisure services to both either reduce the fees for their programs or to so subsidize children from low-income families. Mr. Presante? Uh, yes, we have ongoing discussions with leisure services and the commission about fees and about fee policy and about uh, tax support uh, for their programming. Uh, in the recommended budget, the tax support uh, for leisure services is up substantially. There's also additional funding uh, in, contained in the school budget of, of about $20,000 to help provide support for uh, uh, low and moderate income uh, uh, participants. And uh, also in the CDBG program, uh, d directly responsive to that need, there is uh, uh, $23,400 recommended uh, to support uh, uh, fee subsidies for the after-school programming so that more uh, children in need can participate in that program. So we're trying. Thank you. Um, yes, on the, on the Finance Committee. Uh, Mr. Moderator, according to data provided to the Finance Committee, there's a $111,000 in program subsidies contained in this budget. Thank you. Um, yes, and way against the wall over there. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, I'm, I'm Jim Bursett, uh, Precinct 6, also a member of the Leisure Services Commission and uh, LSSE's representative to the CPA committee. Um, so the Leisure Services has had these discussions about subsidies and costs of our programs for many, many years, and it is ongoing, and it, um, and it will go on, and um, we, we have asked for um, additional subsidies. We're now trying to work as a, as a commission on other ways to, um, you know, put a little pressure on the finance committee and, and town to, you know, address the fact that uh, a greater percentage of our children are now from uh, low and, and reduced income or free and reduced lunch families, in other words. And we're also, as a commission, trying to find ways for the commission itself to um, do additional fundraising and have that money be devoted just to subsidies. And as you, as you know from library fee fines and stuff like that, it, it's a little bit complicated how you can not have money that um, you raise have to go right into the general fund. So it, it, it's kind of, the whole budget thing is very tricky and you know we are trying to do our, our best for that. And, the, and I would just like to ask a question. Um, my understanding is when um, a motion is made to increase a budget into an area that you, you can't designate that into a specific line item. And if, if that's true and we vote for that, I, I would like um, some of that 100000 to be specifically devoted on the recommendation of this body for fee subsidies for children um, who are free and reduced lunch. Um, that, that would go a long way to increasing participation. Um, a lot of times the, the subsidies run out about halfway through the fiscal year, meaning you know, a lot of children, unfortunately, um, 
you know, are not able to participate because of the, the fee, the subsidy structure, and the cost structure. Thank you. So let me start by answering part of your question. You are correct that when we finally vote on a dollar amount, um, we are voting on the bottom line for the community services portion of the budget. Town meeting can make it clear through speaking to the motions what the intent is of what to do with the raised amount or lowered amount, but we can't designate where the amount goes. Um, that's still, it's still the normal people who are in charge of the community services budget deciding where that money goes and they're the ones who allocate it. So town meeting can't allocate line items or can't designate an additional amount to a specific place. Um, we will have plenty of time to go back to discussion on everything, but let's move on to see if there's questions about pools. Any issues on pools? Yes, um, front center here. Uh, Larry Kelly, Precinct 5. A few months ago, the uh, DPW dug up and filled in and receded the uh, waiting pool at War Memorial. Anybody? The microphone didn't like that. Oh, uh, anybody who grew up in town probably remembers it as being called the Little Pool, um, and it served the children of this town for, I would guess, 60 years, since I'm almost that age now, and I remember playing in it as a four-year-old. So I'm just curious as to what is the status. I've heard rumors that we were possibly going to do a spray park there. And I know we got a 200K grant to rehab the War Memorial Pool, which was very successful, and I assume that takes time to do. So I'm curious, with the spray park, have we put in for such a grant, and what is the status of all that? Thank you. Ms. Masanti? Uh, yeah, the waiting pool uh, uh, served many children for many decades and uh, uh, had a lovely life, but it was at the end of its useful life. Uh, there are no current plans for a spray park, although that's actively being uh, explored uh, at one of uh, multiple potential sites, uh, uh, including uh, the community field area or Groff Park or elsewhere, uh, but there's no imminent plan. Uh, if and when we get there, uh, I suspect the approach will be a combination of applying for state grants. Uh, with a local match from sources such as CPA dollars. Thank you. Um, anything else on pools? And anything on golf course? <laughs> and yes, third row from the back in the center there. Hi, good evening. Tracy Lee Bucillier, uh, Precinct 6. Um, so I have a question, and it is on the pools as well as uh, leisure services, other programs, and our social service funding. I know a comment was made a little while ago about the amount of um, subsidies that are going to the programs, and it sounds like quite a lot. My question to my fellow town meeting members would be, let's look at what is being subsidized. Is it the program? that's being subsidized for its expenses and payroll? Or is the subsidies going for the enrollment or towards the enrollment of the children and families that need these services? We've heard over the last few town meetings, quite a few town meetings, um, that the enrollment and the use at the pool, at leisure services programs are decreasing. We know that there are families in our area still, we are losing a lot of our families, but there are families in our area, and they're using leisure services um, programs for the after-school care, the out-of-school time programs. The fact that those programs are being used, the numbers of children that are using those programs, should be indicative of the number of families and children that need the pools, that need leisure services, out-of-school time activities, such as the sports before they get into the high school, the high school sports fees, and I know we're not at the high school budget yet, um, the sports fees that families are facing are very, very high. Another town meeting member has mentioned, you know, comparing our fees to fees in other surrounding towns, and ours are really high. We're talking about our social services, the line item, 
keeping that, keeping that on the budget, increasing that. And I think that that needs to be increased. Our sports and extracurricular activities in our town are becoming elitist by virtue of our low-income families not being able to afford to take part in these programs. And for our community in Amherst, for everything that we have to offer, for our families, the low-income families and children to not be able to take advantage of these because they simply cannot afford it is a shame, in my opinion. And I think that we as town meeting members should consider doing everything that we can to make sure that everyone has the ability to participate. And if that means to increase the... Um, community services budget so that this money is there specifically to augment and specifically to go towards the, um, what is the term I'm looking for? Thank you. The, the subsidies that, um, or for fee reductions and helping out the low-income families and the children that need these programs, then I urge our town meeting members to do this and to consider it. Not so much to go towards the budget, but specifically in looking in, in providing these services to our families and children. I really don't want to say that our please. town becomes very elitist in terms of sports and, and what's available. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's move on. Any specific golf course issues before we open to general discussion? Um, yes, front and center. Uh, Larry Kelly, Precinct 5. So about nine, ten months ago, I think it was June, uh, the town manager said in a memo to the select board that maybe it was time to rethink or bring up, back up the issue of privately leasing out the golf, sending out an RFP to lease out the golf course to a private vendor. Um, that was like ten months ago. So I'm just curious as to what the status is of that no-brainer idea. Mr. Masanti. It's still cogitating around in my brain. <laughs> okay, I'm now opening up to general discussion and then eventually we'll come to a vote. Currently what we have before us are two different dollar amounts. When we do come to a vote, we will first vote on the larger amount, which was the motion to increase from Mr. Oldham. If that passes, we are done. If that fails, we then vote on the lesser amount. So is there further discussion on community services? Yes, Ms. Talman. We were not aware of the amount that was going to be suggested we are now in terms of, of both uh, the item and community services. That money would have to come from reserves, and as was said earlier, we are urging you not to use reserves to support this budget this year. Um, and, and I'd like to clarify another thing. The Finance Committee issues guidelines in November based on the revenues we think we will have for the coming year. And, and that in mind, we set a percentage. And this year it was 2.5% increase over this year's budget. That is sent to the superintendent, the manager, and the library director. They then ha take it to their boards, and those boards give guidelines as to what areas they want supported more or less or whatever. The, the finance committee does not make up this budget. We see the budget. All the departments come to us and talk about <clears throat> you know, their budgets and support them. But we don't say, up that, take that down, whatever. We merely say, are you within the guidelines? But those guidelines and who determines what's in all of these pieces is determined by the appropriate board with guidance from their um, select board directors or, or whatever. So I really wanted to clear that up because I keep hearing you know, get the finance committee, um, because help them to uh, see these issues. And we do see those issues. We see them in a lot of areas, but there's only so much money. And the people that you elect really need to be giving the directions to the manager, superintendent, and the library director. 
Uh, Mr. Steinberg. Yeah. Uh, thank you. The select board obviously did not uh, have an opportunity either to um, discuss the motion that would um, um, enlarge the amount of this particular budget. Um, and our vote was taken on the original budget plan, which was carefully crafted, as Ms. Talman has noted. Um, she pointed out that if uh, there's no other motion to reduce another budget, that um, the um, only way that this could be funded then is out of reserves. Um, and I wanted to just mention to you that uh, as we uh, even consider the budget, there always is a little bit of uncertainty on revenue because we don't know what um, the state is going to ultimately provide to us in the way of state aid um, revenue. And uh, we make the best possible estimate that we can and only vary from it if we have substantial reason to do so. And that when the House Ways and Means budget came out, um, the uh, Department of Revenue issued, as it always does, a new cherry sheet, which is its compilation of what it um, estimates that is going to be available to communities, and uh, that includes charges against the communities that are always shown on a cherry sheet. Um, there is some stress um, that comes out of that last cherry sheet, but um, um, I think that you know we, it's it's reasonable to proceed based upon the original assumption. It is not reasonable to um, add to it given the um, um, all of the planning that went into it and the concern from what was available in the most recent information. And finally, I wanted to just um, posit it in a slightly different way than um, has previously been presented. Um, there's uh, a desire um, in Amherst and has been for a number of years to provide support for human services. I think that we're all pr extremely proud of the fact that Amherst has uh, managed to continue to do so. Um, obviously, the amounts that could be used by human services agencies that provide services in towns are, you know, infinitely large and um, Ultimately, uh, we have to make a reasonable estimate of what we think that is appropriate to uh, provide. And we have done so fairly consistently over the past several years. It's entirely logical that when we have another source for funds that can replace some taxation, that um, that be done. The town manager made that recommendation and presented us a balanced budget that addresses a number of community services needs, um, but uh, um, the um, calculation that was put into it was based upon being able to meet um, our commitment to human services and do it with the funds that are available, including the block grant, and that that is a regional approach. So based upon all of that, I would suggest that consistent with the select board position would be to uh, not vote for the higher amount and vote for the original amount presented. Further discussion? Um, yes. Um, I just want to point out, when I look around, Sometimes I don't see any hands, and you can always stop me then. But if I look at you and then look elsewhere, I probably see you, but I'm looking to see if there's new faces, new people, so stay calm out there. <laughs> okay. Um, so, yes, right there in the center. As I'm listening to this Janet Keller, Precinct 1, um, I'm seeing myself as a seven-year-old and walking a mile to the Boys and Girls Club. And I've got five bucks in my pocket, and I learned to swim. And the, what that did for my life um, was really huge. And I would just ask us, as we look at this, to think about what we would want for our kids or our grandkids all kids deserve these opportunities. Um, thanks. Uh, 
And yes, second row over on the left there, yes. James Scott, Precinct 7. I'd like to support the Finance Committee and the Select Board uh, in urging you to hold the line on this part of the budget. We're going to see a lot more budget recommendations that are going to have a lot of worthy causes that are going to tear at our hearts uh, as to the need that needs to be met. But we're going to have to see it in terms of the whole budget. So I recommend that we support the lower figure. And yes, second row here. Yes, John Fox, Precinct 10. Um, it seems to me that the cash reserve guidelines that I understood are to be in the range of 5% to 15%. Is that right? Yes. And that the current amount in the cash reserves is 9 million within a little bit more, perhaps. I think, I think Ms. Thielman said that we were very close to the 15%, the highest figure. Uh, so it seems to me that the 105,000 that is being proposed here, if it came out of cash reserves, would put us at 14 point something percent. Very small reduction of the cash reserves, and the cash reserves are at the high level of what our guidelines uh, indicate. So it seems to me that we ought to really be talking about the merits of this rather than the dangers to our cash reserve. And, and I would suggest that a number of people have made the case that we have not adequately supported the needs of many of our children in town. And this would help address that issue. So I very much support uh, this motion to increase the budget by 105,000. Yes, right here in the middle. Andy Churchill, Precinct 3. Um, I feel like I don't really know what the situation is as far as subsidies. It sounds like we have $111,000 that are going towards subsidies now, if, I heard, if I'm remembering correctly. But what does that mean in terms of, you know, what does it cost low-income children to participate in leisure services? I don't know how, what the current situation is or how this will make it better. I'm just curious if we have anybody. Yes, over there in the Finance Committee. Um, just by way of a short I, autobiographical statement, I worked in human services for 28 years, long time, with folks with disabilities. Um, there's never enough money to meet all the needs, so it seems. But one of the things that we tried to do in shaping this budget, and working with departments to shape this budget, is finance committees look at something that's reasonable, that's sustainable, and balance in a lot of other needs. We've heard tonight a great deal of expression of, of concern about OPEB benefits and, and how the town's not putting enough money aside for the OPEB benefits. We've heard tonight that there are 31 people in the library who are employees who don't have benefits. We should have money for those benefits. We have a motion on the floor to add $105,000 to the social service line item. That does not say that that money will be spent. That does not say that money will be spent on subsidies for um, recreation programs. It just says, let's put $105,000 into that budget and see if something happens. As someone who worked in human services for a long time, that's not the way we ever did our business. If we need to have additional funds, we need to have assessed needs and we need to put them into context. Part of the context here is fire protection, police protection, education, facility needs. We're looking at, at some point, constructing a fire station. We have here persistent demands for uh, a larger, better, different senior center. We have streets that are falling apart. Some of that CDBG money is going to repair streets. So when you put that all into perspective and you, put, uh, you look at the demands that are going to be made on the town in the near future, you look at how we're going to have it finance things, and you look at 
um, the fact that we have some, some reserves, those reserves are going to be stressed and stressed very quickly. So my suggestion is we have a long budget process, folks. It starts in November. There's plenty of time to sit down with folks and, and, and present your numbers and, and, and let's work on things to be accurate. And, and so we have, uh, as the previous speaker uh, voiced, we, have, uh, we know where we're going. I think this is well-intentioned, but off the mark. And I would strongly uh, urge town meeting to vote down the increased funds, to vote for the budget as written, and then to engage yourself in the process of finding out what the need really is, and let's look at how we can really meet that need within the context of all the other demands that are being made in the town. Thank you. Okay, um, yes, in the back of the aisle there. Michelle, no, 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 I'm sorry, behind you. Michelle Pond. Hi, uh, I'm Linda Shelfon, LSSE Director, and I wanted to um, try to answer Andy Churchill's question about what are some of the costs that we have, and so what does that mean in terms of what someone might pay if they receive a fee subsidy. So uh, generally throughout the year, our fee subsidy is about 50% for whatever the cost of a program is, and the costs do vary. Uh, it's 50% if a family receives a free lunch, and it's 25% if they receive uh, partial um, reduced, reduced lunch. Uh, during the summer, we tend to increase that amount because we see so many, so many more children coming and uh, who have a need for the program. So particularly with our camps, um, we've, um, we, we have increased that to 75% or 50%. And then as far as the range of what the programs cost, um, I know you all get our leisure services brochure. But uh, let me just start with our swimming lessons. Um, swimming lessons are $60. I believe that's correct, $60, $65. So, um, so then we're, we're looking at something that would be um, between 50 and 75% off of that cost. So that's an example. Uh, another example would be our basketball program, which uh, is between $99 and $125, if that's the, um, the radio recreational program. So we can offer between a 25 and a 50% subsidy. However, what we try to do uh, as much as possible is to supplement the subsidy that the town provides with uh, grants and uh, gifts that come from the community. Very generous, we appreciate those so much. And other uh, fundraising events. So sometimes we are able to do a little better than that. Sometimes um, uh, if, we've, if we've got some uh, grant funds that come in, uh, the Kitty Foundation, the Keedy Family Fund, for instance, has been very generous and has provided some additional funds, particularly for sports programs. So on an individual basis, we do talk to families and try to uh, you know, make that um, be a little bit more if we can. Um, it's, um, um, so that's, that's, how, that's what it looks like. That's how we put it together. Thank you. Um. Um, yes, third row on the aisle there. Chris Riddle, Precinct 2. Um, let's see. I, uh, it's, uh, I guess I'm just uh, supporting Mr. Fox here. I think that uh, this is a small sum of money. We've got a huge uh, reserve. Um, I would question the finance, uh, Mr. Kubiak from the Finance Committee, um, are basically saying that we should not touch the whole budget. We just, just vote on it. It's, uh, it's all been thoroughly vetted and, and um, you know, you know, wiser man, minds than mine have, have put this all together. Just leave it alone and vote yes. So I, I'm, I'm going to support Mr. Oldham's uh, article, uh, motion. Thank you. Looking for new hands. Um, yes, right there, second row from the back in the middle there. I'm Mary Streeter, Precinct 8, former school teacher, where I saw what happened in classrooms where some kids could afford the after-school programs and other kids couldn't. We're talking about our kids here, our kids from low-income families that are already challenged with trying to transport kids. I don't see why we wouldn't want to support this wholeheartedly. And there are other areas of the budget that may well be reduced, so this may not come from reserves. We don't know till we're done with the budget. Ready to come to a vote? <laughs> Apparently not. Um, 
Yes, on the aisle there, third from the back. Leo Maley, Precinct 5. Uh, uh, Ms. Streeter touched on it at the very end of what she said. At the end of this, we decide how much money to put into reserves. So it's not as if the dollar figure in reserves today will be decreased by $105,000. It would be that the dollar figure we would be putting into reserves figuratively tomorrow will be $105,000 less. That is a choice. Well, both of those are choices, but they're, but they're very different kinds of choices. So to suggest that it comes out of reserves implies that it comes out of current reserves. What you're actually saying, because I assume we're not drawing on reserves this year, for the last five years our reserves have increased, a good thing, a very good thing in my opinion. But nevertheless, it should just be clear to everyone that there are choices that are being made there. And the implication that town meeting isn't really any implication by anyone that a town meeting doesn't also make choices in the budget process. It just isn't the case because we appropriate the money. Thank you. Well, how much uh, do we intend to put into reserves this year? Well, um, Mr. Pooler. They gave me too short a microphone uh, wire, so I have to keep coming up here, which shows the danger of running short. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I really couldn't resist that. Um, but I do want to answer the gentleman's statement that was just made. Uh, the reserves that we have today are the reserves we have that were built up from as of um, June 30th, 2014. We are not putting any money into reserves uh, going forward, we have what we have. So uh, if it were the case that uh, we increase the budget beyond what we have now presented to you, we would have to reduce our reserve levels. And so, so I just want to make sure that everybody's clear on that concept when you make your decision. I would also like to be clear on principle that I have always tried to instill and that is ongoing expenses should be met with ongoing revenue and one-time expenses should be met with one-time revenue. And I think the problem with using reserves for an ongoing expense, because I assume people would want this expense to continue year after year, is there is not an ongoing revenue source to match it. So I would ask you to consider that in your vote. Thank you. Um, yes, back corner there. Yes, uh, Kenton Thar Precinct 1, there's a couple of things that stand out. One, if we really have higher fees than most communities, that's a problem to begin with. And if halfway through the year we start running out of most of our uh, subsidies and we can't continue the subsidies, then it seems like our intention is only being half met to begin with. And if we've been talking about this for years, it's about time we did something about it. And $111,000 is, in put it, putting that in perspective, is the subsidy that we're giving children in this town. That's all we're giving them. I mean, you know, $111,000 for, ch for children who need the uh, money in order to stay out of trouble by being able to go to a basketball program or do something else. I mean, that's, that's, that's not enough money to begin with. And, you know, you can't compare it to millions of dollars for roads and police and fire and everything else. We're just talking about a, a piddly amount of money to support children. And, this, and if it, has, it should be. It seems like we've been trying to get this in the budget to increase the subsidies for a while. And it's time we did, did do that. And especially in a town like Amherst, which is a fairly privileged town, and if we have to charge high fees and if... 40% of the people have left the town uh, families in the last, what, 15 or 20 years because they can't afford to live here. 
then we have an even more obligation to help the people uh, who can live here. So I do hope that we pass this, and I do think it's something that uh, we need to do as a town meeting, and I don't think everything is beta complete. Uh, otherwise, there would be no need for us to be here. Um, yes, for a throwback right there. Hi, my name is Emmanuel Morales. Um, Pre yeah. Hold oh, the mic sorry. close to your mouth, yeah. So sorry about that. Emmanuel Morales, Precinct 8, and I move for the previous question. Motion for the previous question has been made and seconded. We will now come to an immediate vote. If two-thirds of you vote yes, we will then come to a vote on the community services section of the budget. Everybody with me and understand where we're at? All those in favor of the motion for the previous question, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, please say no. No. Moderator, here's two-thirds. So what we have before us now are two amounts. Um, maybe if we can get them both up on the screen, it would be helpful. The larger amount is for $1,829,276, and that was the increased amount from the Oldham motion. And the smaller amount is the original Finance Committee amount of $1,724,276. So we are now going to come to a vote on the higher amount. If that passes, we're done. If that fails, we go to the lower amount. Any questions? Everybody with me? Great. All those in favor of the higher amount that you see before you for the community services portion of the budget, please say aye. Aye. As opposed, please say no. No. Moderators in doubt, if I see 15 hands, we'll have a tally vote, and I do. So I have already appointed tellers, so I just want to give some quick instructions on the tally vote. I ask everybody to stop what they're doing and pay attention here because they can avoid some mistakes. You will be using tally card number one. A green vote indicates that you are in favor of the higher amount. A red, red card means you are against the higher amount. Um, once I'm finished talking, you will pass your cards to your, towards the aisles here where the tellers are located. Please, please stay in your seats until the tellers have collected the cards and your row has been released. If you are not seated in your row when the tellers collect the cards, your vote will not be counted. If you don't have a card number and you're using a blank card, your name must be on the card or your vote will not be counted. Okay, you may now proceed and pass your cards towards the side where the tellers are located.
The final count is 97 yes and 78 no, so the higher amount passes. I now call on Ms. Brewer to make a motion. Now let's remember this is habit and process. This is not yelling at the new chair. Okay. <laughs> so I move that we continue with this article and move on to the conservation and development section. Do I hear a second? Hey, 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 even joking, let's not do that. Do I hear a second? OK, any discussion before I come to a vote? I see no hands. All those in favor of moving on to another article tonight, please say aye. All those opposed, please say no. The no's have it. Ms. Brewer, I call on you for another one. Hey. hey, people, we're not done yet. Ms. Brewer, I, move, I call on you to make a motion. I move to adjourn to 7 p.m. on Wednesday the 29th. All those in favor of adjourning till Wednesday, please say aye. aye. All those opposed, please say no. We are adjourned. Thank you.